Okay, so um, I'm happy to welcome uh, Jermaine Kaminski at today's Digenomics Brownback seminar. Uh, Jermaine is currently assistant professor for entrepreneurship and innovation at the School of Business and Economic in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And um, previously studied at Witten Herdecke University, uh, the MIT, and finished his PhD study at uh, the Aachen University. Yeah. And his um, research interests include, uh, among others, of course, uh, applied machine learning, crowdfunding, and causal inference and business strategy. Um, he has several high-ranked publications um, in the Journal of Product Innovation Management and the Journal of Business Venturing, which are both ranked as A journals over here. And furthermore, um, I found that you launched um, with several college and um, the website causalscience.org, uh, which yeah. provides um, interesting blog posts and talks, meetings um, about topics in data science. And um, like I, I already signed up and I can highly recommend it to anyone else um, to, who's interested in data science to receive the latest blogs. And so um, to sum up, I think your talk today um, uh, fits um, your your interest quite well and we're all looking forward to your talk on um, opportunities and pitfalls from applied machine learning and entrepreneurship research so Jermaine the stage is yours and we are all curious yes okay uh, thank you Steph uh, Stefan for the uh, for the introduction uh, thanks a lot also uh, for the invitation Lars um, and colleagues so yeah I'm happy to uh, talk here about uh, a bit of my own research um, in the area of machine learning and entrepreneurship but also recently strategy and as some of you maybe also experienced um, so um, this is roughly the reaction that you get from people nowadays on conferences when you say I do something with machine learning yeah because more or less everyone uh, is doing it it's it's not really that outstanding or particular anymore is my feeling um, also, I mean, this is only until 2019 and still, since then it's still continued, as you can see the popularity and search interest in the topic um, is ever climbing, whether deep or machine learning, um, there's a little difference in that. Yeah, but it's a very uh, trending and contemporary topic. And um, so I also in my research, especially during my PhD, um, I focused on especially natural language processing and image recognition, um, of course, deep learning. I mean, deep learning at the end of the day is machine learning. Just It just describes machine learning with multiple layers uh, between us. But nowadays, there is no single layer machine learner really anymore. So you can consider most of the research also done in our field always as deep learning. Um, I experiment right now a bit with generative adversarial networks that are neural networks that can themselves generate content based on learning data and uh, recurrent neural networks um, that <laughs> go into a similar direction. Um, and I use these research insights, let's say, to give product recommendations or improvements for potential product design, in particular in the crowdfunding domain. And what I have done, especially in uh, two publications, is I would consider co developing prediction machines, as uh, uh, Joshua Gans, Argawal, and others would frame it. Um, and because I have seen some of the shortcomings of neural networks in such prediction machines, I just recently switched more into the lower right field of uh, causal inference that I hope in the next years will solve some of the issues in here. Um, just very short back to the origins of machine learning. I always say that also the MBAs uh, in our university sometimes just to be aware where we are coming from. Um, as you know, like this is here in the background, the picture of the famous Enigma. And as you might know, the roots of artificial intelligence are or started with uh, Winston Churchill that once said, give them what they want. Um, in 1944, by the way, nowadays in modern uh, Amazon, Google, um, Facebook, it's not different. Like the CEO very much says the same as Winston Churchill back in the days. Um, there have been, has been Alan Turing uh, working in Bletchley Park, by the way, uh, as you can also see in the picture, a very high share of females that contributed to deciphering the German enigma. So it was very much also uh, women's uh, work and contribution. And um, they together work, developed the so-called bomb that eventually deciphered the German enigma. And that bomb you can consider as one of the first machine learners that existed out there. By the way, Alan Turing is always very popular for the development of that machine, but there was a plethora of especially Polish 
uh, researchers has contributed to its development uh, mathematically. Yeah, and as you know, eventually, um, I think sometimes these days, especially we are reminded of these old days, but um, eventually it enabled the so-called Operation Overlord in the Normandy because the German communications could be largely deciphered. And now I want to explain why I come back to that, because the idea at the roots of artificial, artificial intelligence are in the, the, the main work of Alan Turing um, on the so-called imitation game. And it's called imitation game because, as the quote says, it's about carrying out any operation which could be done by a human computer. And um, that is very much also what my what the starting point of um, or during my PhD was. I wanted to find out um, whether, especially with regard to crowdfunding data, there are tasks in, for instance, venture screening or um, investment decision making that, to some extent, you could automate. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to uh, um, affiliate myself with Alan Turing, of course, that would be aiming a bit too high, but like on the very lower level, it's about the same thing. So to which extent can we replace professionals, venture capital investment decisions? And I want to explain you that as a so-called example of seeing. And the seeing is a term that comes from the social uh, so-called so, um, ladder of causality from Judea Pearl. I'm going to introduce you uh, later in this talk. So what is seeing? Um, first, let's start with the idea of, of crowdfunding and what the data is about. And I only want to concentrate you for now on, the, on that middle image. So what is good about crowdfunding is that analytical, business skilled and creative people come together to create a certain idea or amazing things amazingly fast as the former, former uh, Google president Eric Schmidt uh, described it in a book. And what is also fascinating, I think, about crowdfunding data still is that small ideas um, can quickly become relatively big in a relatively small pond. And when I say relatively small pond, I mean roughly four to six billion dollars in investments if you only consider Kickstarter. Um, but very much a crowdfunding is an idea starter. It's not directly creating new markets right away. But what is also still interesting about crowdfunding is that you won't very much discover products that are alike or are like something that you might already know. Very often they are very novel. And so Kickstarter alone uh, supported now more even than $5 billion um, for 180,000 projects. So I can actually update that number. I just looked into it yesterday. Um, and more than 17 million people supported these projects. And while I said that ideas spawn in crowdfunding, you can still argue that do-it-yourself electronics um, to some extent, virtual reality in particular, Oculus Rift, that ventured the room for something that nowadays is called the metaverse and 3D printing, of course, by the way, roughly 20% of all biggest crowdfunding campaigns on Kickstarter relate only through to 3D printing and variables. Uh, Pebble is a watch that was out there three to four years be before the Apple watch was out in the market. And you could argue that crowdfunding is somehow a testing bed. And that is something that I, I wanted to assess to which extent the crowd might be running ahead of professional venture capital investors and the market development as a whole. And um, yeah, that is documented in one uh, TFSC paper that you can have a look at sometime if you like, uh, published in 2019 with my PhD supervisor, Christian Hopp and Teresa Tikova from back then Stuttgart, now St. Gallen. And uh, to summarize that, that only first, uh, let's say, correlational research um, um, is I found that crowdfunding serves as a relatively well predictor of venture capital investments. And if you only look into the time series in figure A, uh, sorry, on top, and um, it should be A, B, and C, um, you can see that there's a relatively well co-integration in that time series of crowdfunding and venture capital investments, even if you control for other factors such as how, household income or general like economic climate in the indices. Yeah? Um, and what is even more interesting about that, if you, um, if you focus on, for example, only the technology and hardware-related investments, you can measure and that they run roughly three to four months ahead of venture capital. And of course, what you might argue is that venture capital has a certain deal flow and it takes a bit longer, but three to four months is still, I think, a valid signal. And what's even more interesting is in terms of the effect size is that a 1% increase in crowdfunding investments leads to a rough 15% increase in VC investments three months after, which 
makes sense because there's a lot of research that I don't document here um, that shows that indeed crowdfunding can in both directions provide a good and a bad predictor of future VC investments. Uh, I think Lars can also associate with that work. Um, and um, so I think what's interesting here, so what I applied here in the background, so how did I come to the impulse response analysis is that I applied so-called Granger causality. Um, Granger causality, though, is not as causal as you might think. Um, the term suggests that you would be analyzing causal effects, but effectively, Granger causality is about predicting a time series Y with the past values of time series Y plus time series X, meaning that by including time series X, you reduce the error term. And that is then already considered a concept of causality, and that was actually also awarded a Nobel Prize a uh, longer time ago, uh, Cliff Granger. Uh, which of course had uh, a lot of achievements and um, this work uh, for instance so a causal um, uh, yeah Granger causality is very often used in order to detect like interaction among neural networks in the human brain this is also where it comes from um, but you might question the causality in here because the the idea to come from crowdfunding to be in VC investments as a predictor is still very limited because at the end of the day, the message of my research is more that including the values of crowdfunding investments into the prediction of venture capital improved the prediction. That's the message. That's all of it. Yeah. So it improved the prediction. And there's a lot of work, by the way, by Helvarian uh, on Google on so-called now casting that is exactly doing the same with household prices uh, correlated with uh, unemployment and so on and so forth. And then there, I dived a bit deeper into uh, from the from time series on the more um, uh, panel observational level, let's say, more on 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 campaign level. Um, that is published in a uh, small business economics um, paper. And um, so what is interesting about Kickstarter here is that it's, as you might know, a relatively rich data source. Yeah? If you only concentrate on the main starting page, you can see there's a title, a short description, you know how much is raised and what the goal was. And what's even more interesting is that you have a video, that video has speech content, and the video also has uh, items inside that are visible or can be made uh, can be measured with the so-called video intelligence API that I later used in my research. So we got a, 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 a grant from Google Research to use the one of the first versions of the so-called Google Video Intelligence API. And I want to show you shortly um, what it does. So you see on the left side, the video that is being processed through the API. And on the right side, the, the API is able to identify um, the respective labels of what is visible in that image. Yeah. So you see it's, it has a relatively high level even. So it's able to identify music workstations, synthesizers, even whether the human has a beard or not, or potentially what gender he or she has. Um, so that is data that I used. Um, eventually, um, I was able to generate um, yeah, only text token from the project descriptions, uh, 7.5 million speech uh, tokens, so words that were transcribed, 2.6 million. And then there were 922,000 texts of objects in videos across 20,000 campaigns. Yeah. So on average, for each video um, I have in the data, there are 45 objects identified that appear in the video. And the question is, um, is the text enough to predict? Is the speech enough? Or is all of it combined uh, maybe the best predictor? Um, just to give you an idea here, this is how the data then would look like. You have, of course, the description text as a string. You have the speech content that is transcribed with a certain confidence. And you have the video content. Uh, by the way, what I have to say, I'm sometimes surprised about quite some crowdfunding research um, in, yeah, also relatively high published, because what I found in my PhD is that about uh, 5 to 10% of speech content and descriptions on Kickstarter especially older campaigns, are not written in English. Um, and what is interesting about it, that there are quite some topic model or language and emotion and language papers in the crowdfunding domain that never mention that they filtered out the non-English uh, campaigns. So I'm always uh, sometimes surprised like how much garbage might be here and there in some of the data. 
Um, yeah, and as you can also see, last but not least, you can see for how long uh, certain um, objects are visible, just to show you how the data is represented. Um, now I want to show you how you can visualize a certain documents in a high dimensional vector space. You might have heard of principal component analysis already. So uh, please focus your attention only to figure number C uh, for now. What you can see there is the so-called uh, TSNE document embeddings of video tags. And the large blue points mean overly successful crowdfunding campaigns. And the purple ones generally mean they were non-successful campaigns. So they were coded as zero. And what you can see there, that is, let's say, in the upper part of the picture and the lower right, there's a, at least a little higher agglomeration of successful crowdfunding campaigns that seem to share relatively similar document embeddings, yeah, meaning positions. And that space is 200 dimensional. Yeah, Just to explain that in short, you know what a two dimensional model is, a typical x, y axis. You can imagine three dimensions. And as uh, Geoffrey Hinton, one of the fathers of machine learning would say, um, uh, 200 or 300 dimensions, you just is a three dimensional model and you need to loudly say to yourself two or 300. Yeah? It's something we can't imagine, but it has 200 dimensions in which the words in a document or the objects are aligned to each other, meaning whether they are syntactic or semantically similar or different, whether they are close or distant. And that is done um, with vectorization, or in my case here, a so-called paragraph vector that uh, is called doc2vec. You might have heard of a word to vec. It's exactly the same, just on document level. Um, I would say if I would do the research right now, I would probably use a so-called BERT model, a BERT transformer, because at least in benchmarks, it has shown to be a bit more precise. If you have questions on how to come up with uh, such an analysis and how to measure the word vectors, uh, feel free to reach out after the talk or anytime in the next uh, weeks. Yeah. So I have to say, when I did this PhD, when I wrote this in 2018, 19, uh, it all was very undocumented. I needed to reproduce papers, hard coded. Nowadays, thanks to scikit-learn, the Gensim library, and a few others, uh, it's very straightforward, probably 10 times as fast to do the research that I've done back in the days. Yeah, So there are a lot of new and good tools, which also explain the, the prevalence of machine learning in our field nowadays. It's, it's relatively cheap to enter. Um, by the way, only producing the labels for the video content uh, in, in today's terms would cost 6,000 euros. And we luckily got it for free for using the early version of the API. So that is uh, also, also shows you <laughs> how that developed at least. So um, what we do here is again, like we, we, we pass the description speech and video data, we lowercase it, lemmatize it, remove stop words and create so-called ingrams so that terms like New York are not two distinct terms, but recognized as, uh, as one term. Um, then you vectorize it, as I said, with a doctor vec and reduce it to a 200 dimensional matrix. And that then that feature for every campaign, you can feed into a regression that you liked. I, in my case here, benchmarked several ones, a linear and nonlinear classifiers, um, and then regressed it against a given outcome, the label one or zero, meaning successful or non-successful campaign, and additionally, a five-fold cross-validation. And it turns out, um, that actually, um, by the way, um, yes, text, speech, and video content is the best predictor, but it's so marginal over just text and speech prediction, maybe only one to two percentage points, um, that you might reconsider whether it is really worth the work. Because it turns out that actually the, the document embeddings between text description, speech, and what you see in the video are so similar that apparently... Uh, the information is so overlapping that it doesn't add to a better prediction of the model. That it at least that is at least an assumption because we don't really know what the decisive weights in the neural network are. And that is also the danger of, of, of machine learning and predictions. Um, you know what you feed in, uh, you know what the accuracy of a prediction is, but you sometimes don't really know what was now the reason. And you can only approach that to, to a certain extent. Um, in my case, um, what I did is that I um, I used the so-called rich regression, that is a penalized regression, and I then measured the beta coefficient magnitude of the contribution to a certain prediction um, 
uh, in the three different um, data sources. I'm sorry, I just see someone raising the hand. So I see you raising the hand. Maybe we, we make questions directly. Yeah, just a clarification question on the previous yeah. slide. If you go back. Uh, so yeah. No, no, the one afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So this is a com combination. What about individual uh, text and or speech? Or yeah. Video? Did you also do that? It's just a clarification yeah. question. Yeah. So uh, well, I, I don't list that here for brevity, but like um, all, let's say the baseline of only text and only speech is also about 69%. Yeah. Okay. So um, hardly any difference then. Yeah, hardly any difference. Like you only improve by a maximum two percentage points. Yeah, that is also what we made very transparent in the paper that the result is not as great as we hoped it to be. Interesting. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what you then can do, at least to approximate, like what could be potential predictors, is you run a rich, uh, a rich regression, a penalized regression, as I said, on features and the outcome. And it turns out that uh, reciprocal language, like thanks, uh, update, uh, featured, um, perfectly, community, amazing, early, proud, incredible. They're also positive language. Are very good predictors. It's, I would say, not so surprising if you have ever watched an Apple keynote. Um, but what is also interesting is that uh, talking about ideas or prototypes or marketing or let's say business using business type language are all very bad predictors uh, in the crowdfunding setting and how that can be explained I will come back to later because there is a might be a bias in here. For the speech content, by the way, it's very similar. Yeah, so again, like awesome, um, perfect, really, thanks, amazing, excited. You see, again, positive language really is a very good predictor for crowdfunding outcomes, whether talking about uh, websites, social service, and industry are all bad predictors um, for negative outcomes, meaning uh, non-success. And now comes um, uh, the funny part, also video content. Again, you see on the left side, um, advertisement, illustrations, presentation type, so business type of presentations, um, animations or icons are all bad predictors of crowdfunding outcomes if you show these items in a crowdfunding uh, video campaign. On the other hand, uh, showing the tools, the machinery, uh, the engineering, uh, wilderness, uh, bicycles and students, meaning how people, how, how uh, students potentially use it in the wild, how actually they use the product are all good predictors. Yeah, so the, the difference is really whether you have more a lab, a hypothetical setting, or whether you show how it really works and how that can be explained. Again, I will come back to after. What you could now do is you can now um, use that data input um, that, that we have from what do we know about successful campaigns. We can speak uh, or insert a hypothetical crowdfunding uh, campaign video and um, or only speech content. And based on that, then the computer here, a hard-coded Amazon Alexa would give me feedback. Alexa, how did you like my project presentation? I think you presented the problem in your product solution really well. Maybe you can highlight your own qualifications and be more positive in language. Also, consider to make the community feel being part of your project. Yeah, so that is just a simple example how I fed in like, a, like um, a synthetic text and based on the features it identified, it, it concluded that I need to be more positive and relate more to community because these features are known to be good predictors. Yeah. Okay, so far that story on correlation and using prediction features. What I further found is that um, beards, um, uh, I think Lars would be a way well set up right now for a crowdfunding campaign. I wouldn't be so. Uh, I seem maybe also not. So um, like beard uh, are rather negative predictors for crowdfunding outcomes, which of course is confounded by the fact that females can and cannot appear. Um, beers and cats are very good predictors. Um, that is mainly because there are a lot of beer related projects that are successful in Kickstarter. So if you ever want to run a very likely successful campaign on Kickstarter, do something related to beer. Yeah? Even better, if you include women and cats, it is not clear whether the women here as the predictor are founders or models. Yeah, that is, for instance, and something we can't say because in some of the campaigns are analyzed and that is not in the publication for, for the reason that I wasn't sure about the biases in here. Um, we don't know whether that are just models being used or actually female founders. There's a lot of uh, research and crowdfunding pointing towards 
uh, female founders being more successful. Um, but we don't know whether that is also true for the video data. Um, emotions, by the way, are not necessarily good predictors um, because there have been a lot of non-successful campaigns that have been overly emotional, yeah, uh, close to uh, what you could uh, call a fake it until you make it. And yeah, what is, of course, interesting about that is the question, why should cats be a positive predictor of crowdfunding outcomes, as here with that campaign? that raised uh, 3.4 million euros. There is not clearly um, a reason to assume why cats would be positive predictors. And this is how we come also to the story of causal inference and something that we are uh, working on right now also with my colleague uh, Paul Hünermund and Christian Hopp. Um, first, like there's a, a sample selection bias in the data that I just explained. Yeah, so um, we don't really know the share of male and female. It's also hard to control for that in, in that case because we don't have that data. And selection bias implies there are already a lot beer-related campaigns that are successful. And it might just be um, happenstance that cats appear in, in videos that are successful, but it doesn't make them a successful predictor. On the other hand, how can some of the video features of In the Wild versus illustrations be explained that has to do with product maturity? The less mature a product and crowdfunding is, the more likely the founders will relate on, on, on sketches and illustrations and advertisements, whereas projects that are further developed um, show more how it's really being used and produced and yeah, how, how people use it. So they, they show hands and the product. And um, yeah, so that also it can be explained with the fact that such projects that are further developed and show more how a product works have a, um, according to the construal level theory, a lower a temporal psychological distance. Yeah, and that is also what we show experimentally, by the way, in one uh, journal of business venturing publication, I think that Stefan mentioned. Um, but we have that kind of predictions um, that are more or less uh, isobars or areas of risk uh, or churn here. We have that very often in business. And this is only taken as an example from a McKinsey study in 2017-18. Um, the red-blue uh, areas show a so-called isobar that analyzes areas of risk yeah, for customer churn from a telecom example. But you, what you can see here, like the classical regression analysis would be green. And um, McKinsey then claimed with machine learning, they are very well able to identify those customer chain areas and make better predictions. It turns, by the way, out uh, two years later, there was another study, they couldn't really. And that is because, and that is the case with all machine learning, it's mostly model free. There's no underlying model that really explains the causal effects. So there's no underlying model in the data that explains why cats make products so successful. It could just be that, um, that cats are more likely to be included by people that uh, know how to play with certain internet memes. And such people might have a bigger social network in the internet and so on and so forth. So the causal explanation behind why cats should be a good predictor um, is still very uncertain. And now what we do in the current study is first we, we try to reproduce again our own research uh, again, claiming that cats are positive predictors and then trying to find out with a causal graph and diagram why that is. So we are also contacting the founders, asking how the cat came into the video. And we will also run uh, two or three experiments where we want to analyze how the inclusion of cats in a video, um, in, in a synthetic crowdfunding video, improves people's likelihood to, uh, to contribute. Yeah, so we try to leverage all uh, three levels of causal inference with experiments, of course, being the gold standard and the most expensive. Um, looking a bit further of what, what we can expect in the years to come, I think also for entrepreneurship, in, both in research and also in practice, I think is what I, something I'm working on right now and is what I would call computerpreneurship. I know, yeah, we are probably all a bit uh, tired of uh, new terms, yeah, but uh, it's, it's something uh, that, that, that haunts me for a while. Um, because we see these projects where computers are creating art, yeah, the so-called Edmond de Bellamy that was a, um, a computer generated art trained on 15,000 portraits. That's a generative adversarial network that was trained to produce that new picture. 
Um, and yeah, generative adversarial networks are everywhere, uh, as you know. Um, also here, you see two faces of people that actually don't exist. Yeah, so such technologies, as you can imagine, are also used for internet warfare nowadays um, to um, display or mimic agents that don't exist. And if you consider the left picture is not real, the right is also not real, but you can guess that the computer has issues with rendering um, proper human glasses. But you can here already see, and this is two years old, um, how well computers uh, have developed these capabilities. If you would render the same image by now, um, I'm, it's very likely that even the glasses will be perfect because generative adversarial networks are developing really fast and uh, sufficient. Um, you can also, I could also use the 21,000 crowdfunding campaigns that I had in order to come up with the user entrepreneurship type of campaign, yeah? So you need to imagine that there's a so-called recurrent neural network and recurrent neural networks learn based on existing data, how to reproduce their own content. In, in that case, it's not a, a, a letter, but a word or sentence-based classifier that is developed in order to create new sentences based on training sentences. And what was interesting about that is that even though of course it can only learn based on data that exists, it was, uh, to my own surprise, already able um, uh, to show or to create a relatively typical pitch for Kickstarter because it was able to infer that it should be a baby-related product because these projects really are successful in crowdfunding. And it was even able to articulate problem solving. So someone that encountered a problem and then attached it. And of course, the sentence he can be used to be the first tool that we can achieve their own solution to the tackle of the final product. That is not proper grammar, that is also clear, but expect that these algorithms will further develop in the next years and um, yeah, become more and more precise in really formulating need solution pairs, if you want, as uh, von Krug and von Hippel, for example, uh, formulated them. So I think th that is what we can expect to come. So computational entrepreneurial agents that are able to act independently on the marketplace and something like Amazon uh, or fulfillment by Am Amazon is only the whole beginning of it. Yeah. So I think that will be a topic in entrepreneurship in the next years uh, to come. And what is also important to realize here that these agents have limitations. Yeah. So they are necessarily not creative, they are recreative. And image recognition in particular has limitations you might be aware of. Yeah, You see here an image of, what can you see here? Maybe Lars or someone else. What, what's, what can you see in the picture? A duck or rabbit? Yeah, but for the computer, it depends how you twist the image so that it either identifies a duck or a rabbit. But such biases of probabilities of predictions are all out there. Um, this is from a 2018 study um, that shows that uh, computers cannot differentiate chihuahua or muffins, bagels or mops or Trump and chicken breast. To the computer, these images look very much the same. Um, research scientists also trained uh, neural networks in order to identify um, a breast cancer and histology images. And it turns out that actually pigeons were able to beat the computer with an 88% versus 80% accuracy. Yeah, so it always depends. It's not must not only be humans at the task sometimes. It can only be pigeons. It can also be pigeons. But I want to say that computers have amb ambiguity issues and a little noise can make a lot of difference for a computer. So for instance, if you see the picture to the left, uh, the panda, um, the computer has a 54% confidence, um, a large image classifier in 2015 it was, that this picture of a is a panda. And if you add only little, little noise to that image that is invisible to the, to the uh, human eye, it comes up with a 98% confidence that that panda all of a sudden is a gibbon. Yeah, And we have that all out there in the data. Um, I need to check the chat for a second because I see a question. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, good, good, good uh, point by Asim in the chat. I fully agree. What I, by the way, also observed is in my own crowdfunding data that I scraped um, is that when white females were pitching a crowdfunding product and they were using a screw, it was identified as a screw. When black 
uh, white or female founders were pitching a crowdfunding product and uh, using a screw and having screws on the table, it was identified as a gun and ammunition. And that is because this training uh, training algorithms are biased by the training data from YouTube and elsewhere, where it's a huge uh, unweighted bias towards blacks being criminal or criminalized. Yeah, And that is always um, all out there in the data. And whenever you see or read a crowdfunding or not crowdfunding paper that analyzes uh, facial expressions or items in the videos, uh, from my experience, I have to say you need to be very careful because I've seen how inaccurate those systems are. And in none of the papers, there's a proper benchmark. Like if I have a 20,000 campaigns and I would only eyeball control a hundred of them, it's by way, it's no way uh, sufficient enough to claim it's, it's robust, yeah? So I think we need to be very careful with the interpretation and use of such uh, features that eventually are predictors. Um, and now I want to come back because why that matters for companies. And it's a bit unusual twist in my recent research because I somewhat uh, rediscovered um, the jobs to be done theory and uh, Clayton Christensen in particular, you might have heard of. Um, so Clayton Christensen, unfortunately, was a very famous scholar from Harvard Business School, probably one of the most famous in the, in the past uh, 15, 20 years. Um, he ventured the terms uh, disruptive innovation and the jobs to be done. Um, that is him, unfortunately, passed away from cancer, I think, uh, four years ago. And he and a colleague, Theodore Levitt at Harvard, claimed that the people don't want to buy a quarter inch roll, they want a quarter inch hole. Yeah? And detecting that in observational data with machine learning would be relatively difficult. Because as you know from the theory, there, please only look in the lower part, there are three dimensions, functional, emotional, and social. And the question is always what makes a user or what makes a customer use a certain product or prefer it over another? And he always um, took the very famous example of the McDonald's milkshake, because as you can imagine, McDonald's is a company that has a large trophy of data and they did all, all sorts of observational studies, even experimental studies. And they didn't really find out how to improve, how to increase the revenue of the McDonald's milkshake, even after they did some iterations with the product. So certain tastes, um, uh, different uh, offers, coupons, whatever. Um, because they weren't really able to identify the, the, the causal reason why people got the milkshake. Um, the only thing they knew is that 50% of the McDonald's milkshake sales happened before eight o'clock in the morning. And so what they did is they went to McDonald's at uh, six, seven in the morning and asked people what the reason is why they buy the milkshake. And they are completely surprised by the result because that was nothing in the data. The only reason why most of the American customers buy milkshake is that they have a long and boring drive to work and they need something to keep engaged with life, as the study says. Yeah. Why do I tell that? Because at the end of the day, both in entrepreneurship, but also, of course, in strategy, um, a theory that I have about the product or market is a statement of causality. And every time that you as a manager take an action, is it should be predicated by theory. So when I know that customers buy the McDonald's milkshake to keep engaged with life, what I can do if people feel bad about having a milkshake at F8 in the morning, um, I can improve certain campaigns and make it appear more green. And I can also look for another job to be done in that area that I can solve with the same product. But these changes about the product were really only motivated by the qualitative interviews and the causal insights they provided them with. Nothing of that was observational in the data and could be measured. And uh, we have that very often in business practice, as we recently found out with uh, some of the research that we do uh, on causal inference. And I will I will jump a few slides here and only tell you why where that motivation comes from. So as I've shown you, I've realized and also colleagues in our own research that these machine learning predictions are very limited. And turns out we wanted to know a bit more about causal inference in business. And so my colleague, uh, Paul Hünermann from Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen University and I sat down in 2020 and uh, said, yeah, let's make a little workshop on the topic. Let's invite two, 20, 30 people, discuss, um, show what we have, what the problems are, and then ask industry what, what they do and what their issues are. 
Um, so that 20, 30 people workshop then turned into a 900 people conference where we are completely overwhelmed by the attendance. Um, last year, we also had a thousand attendees because this cats as predictors issue is prevalent in industry everywhere because the machine learning classifiers have that, that, that black box um, issue. And indeed, like there are a few companies out there like Walt Disney that you might assume have a kind of causal graph and a causal theory of how things relate. By the way, there's a recent research by um, uh, Alfonso Gambardella and colleagues that shows also how the scientific approach, how important theory building is for entrepreneurs. And that somehow relates to that. And I think also in the research that is to come, we, we want to make a, a bridge between the topic of causality strategy and how it relates to entrepreneurship, but also then how both in research and practice, uh, entrepreneurs need different tool sets um, to come to more causal conclusions. Yeah, um, because I will uh, jump a few slides now. Let's say the, uh, the, the survey, a survey that we did, it uh, turns out that the companies are optimizing for something that re really doesn't cause a change in customer behavior. And the correlation um, on, on input patterns alone is not what helps them to improve. I can uh, openly relate to companies like Zalando, uh, so companies that really scale and face these issues. And when a company like Zalando or Amazon has a causal inference problem, it can easily and quickly mean half a million or a million euros in, in lost revenue. Uh, and you can imagine that the companies are doing a lot of A-B experiments, especially Booking.com, Amazon, uh, among others. But it's um, the point is when you do an experiment also as a big uh, um, supermarket chain, doing experiments, especially in brick and mortar business is expensive. But the advantage of causal inference with methods such as directed acyclic graphs by Judea Pearl, the advantage is that you have observational data and that you then add um, a formulated theoretical model and you have um, control and treatment already in your observational data. So you don't have to come up with it. You do that retrospectively, wise uh, it's also called a quasi-experimentation by some people. Um, so... As you can see, experiments are, and also A-B experiments are the most prevalent method in industry. Um, but indeed, like already almost 30% of companies are using directed acyclic graphs and now ask me how many people do that in academia. So directed acyclic graphs are in, in economics in particular, in management science even more, uh, vastly underrepresented compared um, uh, to industry. Um, again, I will jump over a few slides. W what is happening right now is that we observe a so-called productivity J-curve with regard to causal inference and more and more companies. That is an argument we, we have in a working paper right now that we are publishing at the Academy of Management. Um, we are, um, or let's say it will be on SSRN and if you like, I can share it. Um, so we argue that the causal inference is becoming more and more a strategic resource because you cannot only infer um, insights for a product or something newly developed or markets um, uh, relatively cheaply, but also relatively precisely. And what we observe right now is that companies are having the so-called investment period as we had it with machine learning as well. So a lot of data um, is, is uh, accumulated, mechanisms are developed, and the time that the companies can leverage these investments will come very soon. And just a few weeks ago, we observed a large merger among Amazon and Microsoft that now are together developing the so-called DoY library that is the or one of the go-to libraries, uh, Python-based, um, to apply causal inference in data. Um, and by the way, also one of the Turing awardees next to Judea Pearl, he also just recently, Joshua Bengio, one of the machine learning fathers, you could say, um, he also very recently twisted his research towards more uh, causal theory. And so it's also no surprise that companies like, like Netflix or here um, Amazon hire more and more people from that field. Um, and uh, let me jump a few slides. So um, to give you one, one very simple example here, like how do we come up with direct ACQ graphs? I, I won't show all of the conditions and the whole theory. That's actually a whole book, the, the book of why by Judea Pearl. Um, if you like, we can also do a, sometime a little workshop on that. But um, just to give you one simple example. So you have here, um, you have here like a, a simple 
um, visualization from an example uh, from LinkedIn. So you uh, know, like when you browse on LinkedIn, you will see the job title and sometimes then, or the company or LinkedIn can then measure the view to apply rate. Yeah. Um, considering this task as a classical machine learning problem, we would focus on the relationship between the variables job title, uh, which is one of the job posting has a job title in zero otherwise, and the view to apply rate um, as we can observe it in the data as LinkedIn. A naive estimate might observe that the postings that have a job title have on average, let's say 10% higher view to apply rate, from which we conclude or could conclude that making the job title a mandatory field in job postings would in indeed be a strategic uh, valuable decision. Yeah. Um, however, this estimate is likely an overstatement of the effect of a job title on that view to apply rate. Why? Um, let's look at figure B. Here we have drawn a causal graph of the situation with arrowheads indicating cause and effect relationships as you do it in a directly acyclic graph. This reveals that our effect estimate might be affected by a confounder we didn't observe before, here company popularity. Intuitive larger, more popular companies are more likely to include a job title in their posting. And at the same time, people are more likely to apply to a popular company after seeing the job posting from them. Yeah. So that is also like uh, basically where the, the cat comes in. The, the company popularity here in that machine learning case would have been the company popularity. And there you also see why formulating an explicit model, an acyclic model with uh, acyclic graphs, for instance, or um, causal structure models in general, um, yeah, is a very important task for data science nowadays and why it's so requested by companies. So that is traditional machine learning input training outcome. And that is what we will have very soon. So we will have a causal query where we explicitly define a theory and a causal model of how the data relates to each other, how we assume the data generation uh, process to be, the so-called causal inference engine, and then we try to make predictions. And to conclude there, that is what uh, Judea Pearl, uh, who got the Turing Award, uh, which is one of the highest prizes for computer science, uh, if you want the Nobel Prize for computer science on the theory, calls um, climbing the causal ladder. So entrepreneurship strategy research right now is very much in the area of seeing, at least in observational data, so not with experiments. Um, and we need to get with observational data more towards doing, mean interventions in the data and potentially also counterfactual reasoning. Yeah. So we are shifting from just having big data is good to big data needs to be completed with smarter models. And that smarter models is the, the higher level, so to say. And um, what that means is that the observational causal inference will very soon be placed somewhere between correlation-based machine learning and um, yeah, the gold standard of experiments that, as you know, are more expensive. So it's a very likely good compromise. And uh, that is still expensive, but there's a lot of work, especially done on, on causal discovery and similar methods that right now is working on reducing um, the cost of causal inference. And there are a few libraries out there. That's all in the slides I will provide to you. Um, we are for industry working on a causal data science canvas. Um, we found out that there is a demand for that. I didn't think uh, industry or anyone else would need another canvas, <laughs> but uh, apparently that is the case for that topic. Yeah, so, um, and uh, to conclude, maybe hands up, who of you has seen the, the AlphaGo documentary? Um, okay, good. Uh, thank you, Lars. Uh, I always let the, the MBAs watch that as a preparation because it's really interesting. It shows how the human on one hand gets completely defeated by the computer player, by DeepMind's AlphaGo, but there was one game in which he was winning because he made a so-called God move. And that means he made a move that was not predictable for the computer because the computer didn't expect such a move. It was not in the training data. And it was Lee Sedol's human causal inference to know that the computer likely cannot predict that. So he discovered what the bias of the computer is. Right. And that is a, a genuine human capability. And I think arguing a bit with uh, with marketing theory is what we see here is a marketplace drama of humans versus computers where I think causal inference, not only in research, but also in practice, 
will contribute to the fact that we will understand again that, that humans will not be out of the equation with machine learning and machine learning research, but in fact need to be re-included. Yeah, so that's a typical marketplace drama where I think some of us always expected the crisis that everything will be automated and uh, humans will not be needed there and there anymore. And not only blue, but also white collar people are being replaced. I think especially with uh, causal machine learning, that will not be the case. The opposite is the case that human expertise, managers expertise, will need to invade more and more into data analytic uh, projects and uh, research. Yeah, And uh, only to, ex um, to advertise, so that was our causal data science meeting. Oh, that is a wrong order. Um, last year, so we had um, Sara Magliacciane as uh, keynote speakers and uh, Guido Imbens, you might have heard of. That was a rather lucky pick because we had him confirmed before he was awarded. Um, and they are this year, it will take place on uh, November 9th to 10th um, at Maastricht University in Copenhagen University online again. And we are happy to announce Judea Pearl as our keynote speaker, plus a second female I cannot announce yet. Um, but it will be a very interesting lineup and you are invited to participate for free. Um, yeah, so I will maybe send an invite to Lars uh, when it happens. So. Yeah, the blog was already mentioned. I recommend to those that are interested these two books. Um, and if you are at the Academy of Management, you are invited to join our session on causal inference in strategic management, uh, where we show how we cannot reproduce an um, SMJ paper once we apply causal methods. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's basically um, it for now. And I, I hope, um, yeah, that was an informative and interesting talk uh, for most of you.